Thank you for coming. I'm Angie Montavo, and I am the Western Mass Engagement Director. And this is kind of exciting because we have a live broadcast, y'all. <laughs> so it's, we also have members from the eastern part of the state um, dialing in via Zoom. And then we have, um, actually, this is a live stream that is streaming, you know, currently. Um, whenever I ask an entrepreneur about their finances, it's like I just said an F word, but the different type of F word. Unless you're one of our panelists, right? They're all geeky in the finance <laughs> world. They love their spreadsheets. Um, so we, you know, we've gathered some experts in the field, and we're hoping to share with you, you know, how do you leverage your finances? How do you read those numbers to grow and also to secure your future, right? Because when we go into business, whether we're creatives or consultants or we're selling an actual, actual product, we don't go into business to look at balance sheets and income statements and P&Ls, but we go to maybe own our own time and secure our financial future. And so the panel will go through a deep dive of that. Um, I'm gonna hand it over soon to our moderator, but before I do, I'm hoping Scott McPherson can come out. And I wanna thank him this space is provided to us by Holyoke Media, and it is, it is truly a gem within our community to have this space. So Scott, if you want to say a few words. Great. Thank you, Angie. Um, so I'm Scott McPherson. I'm the executive director here at Holyoke Media. We're so glad to see you all here this evening. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit and are a completely free to use membership-based organization. So everything that you see here in front of you tonight is can be used 100% without charge. Um, I'm sure as you were milling about upstairs, you saw some of our audio production capabilities. We have editing systems, the whole kit and caboodle for anything that you need. Um, we are a membership-based organization. Again, membership is also free. Uh, you can sign up for members on our to become a member on our website, holyoakmedia.org, under the About section. Uh, Thank you all for coming out, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I'll be around for the rest of the evening. Thank you. Hey, thank you. And one more shout out to UMass Five College Credit Union. Thank you, you know, for supporting the chamber. We get to make things like this happen, and you support small businesses. So thank you for that. And with that, I give it to our moderator. Oh, did I get that mic? Oh no. You <laughs> All right, I pushed the button. Sounds like everyone can hear me. Awesome. Well, welcome everyone. I want to take a second before we jump in as well to thank Angie and Mel from the chamber as well as Scott for allowing us to have this awesome uh, networking event tonight. And so I want to welcome you all who are here in Holyoke as well as our streamers live to our financial fireside chat panelist event. Up here, I should introduce myself first. My name is Craig Boven. I'm the Vice President of Marketing of the UMass Five College Credit Union. I'm not the brain power up here. That's the four panelists over here to my left. Um, so I'll be asking the panelists some questions tonight. Uh, I believe there's some slips of paper there. So if uh, any of the conversation that's happening stir some questions for you, please write down your question. We'll take questions at the end of the session here. And uh, we're looking to do this for about an hour. Um, so without further ado, why don't we dive in and meet our panelists tonight? So I'm just going to go left to right here, and I'm going to start with a financial advisor from Chark Oak Finance, from Charter Oak Financial, Terrell Joyner. Terrell, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. My name is Terrell Joyner, again, financial planner with Charter Oak. I also have a consulting business, so doing small business consulting, really focused on operations. Um, I also teach adjunct at Elms College, risk management and insurance for the CFP program and the MBA program, and personal finance for the undergrad students. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Terrell. LW? Hi, thank you for having me tonight. My name is Laura Williams, go by LW, and I am a financial advisor with Edward Jones in Northampton at Six Market Street. I also own a little small business known as Scotty's. It's a little golf driving range in Leeds, and I'm really happy to be able to share a little bit of my background and expertise in that area. Um, we're wearing a few different hats, is always fun, and I'm sure you guys can appreciate some of that. Thank you so much for having me. 
Thanks, OW. Taylor? Hi, everyone. My name is Taylor Robbins. I am also with UMass Five College Federal Credit Union. I support small businesses as the commercial relationship manager. Um, I started my working career at a restaurant and did eight years doing bookkeeping for that restaurant, as well as running it. So I've seen the inner workings of a business, and now I get to support that as well. So thank you for having me. Last but surely not least, Ben. All right, thanks, Craig. And yeah, thanks, everyone. I'll just echo the thanks that everyone passed on to uh, the, uh, the Mass uh, LGBT Chamber, UMass 5, and the host, and everyone uh, thrilled to be here tonight. Uh, ben Palkowski, Old Colony Law. Uh, I'm an attorney. I'm a CPA. I focus my practice a lot on asset protection. We'll get into that more, I'm no doubt, tonight. But basically, I'm here to help uh, small business uh, owners, you know, protect their assets from the risks that are associated with running a business. So uh, we'll unpack that a little bit more. But I like to say that our law practice is, you know, we're not reactionary. We're proactive in terms of helping business owners. We don't wait for problems to happen. We like to make sure preventative mechanisms are in place. Uh, and so that's what we're all about. Awesome. Thanks, Ben. This is what I mean with brain power in the room up here, guys. <laughs> So we're going to jump into a couple questions. Um, we're going to start with a few what if scenarios. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and dive into these questions. Uh, the first one is more centered around starting your own business. So in this scenario, you were recently laid off from your corporate job as a consultant and wanted to take your skill set you gained from your old job and start your own firm. You were a consultant then, so you decide to stay one. You start a book of business, but you really haven't taken off. You really don't feel like you know what you're doing besides offering consultant services. Sound familiar, right? So you walk into Holyoke Media on February 7th, 2024, and you meet these professionals. Panelists, where should that person head from here? Any takers? I don't mind hopping in. Yeah. Um, so this is a fun one. COVID really helped people realize their value, right? So we were a lot of people out of work, getting this unemployment, and they were like, hmm. Does the company truly value me? So actually, there's been an explosion in consultancy. So ironically, that's so fitting. Um, one of the first things that we would talk about with an individual is, hey, do you know your expenses at home? Like, what do you need to bring home to feel confident and not feel financially stressed? So that's number one. You need to know what income you need to bring in on the home front, especially if you have family, a spouse. That can add stress at home. Once you know that piece, what is your service? What are you selling? What is that consultancy um, providing to the community? And if you can't articulate that well, that's gonna not sell well. So once you know your value proposition, how much are you gonna charge? So now you know what you need to make at home, you know what you need to charge, or what your value is, how many clients do you need to see? Just to make the home life okay. Then you need to figure out what is the overhead for your business, so then how much additional do you need to make to just break even? And most of us don't get into business just to break even. So how much do you need above and beyond that to ultimately profit from that business? So a lot of people don't think about the money aspect when it comes to running a business. They're just excited. And that's personally where my consultant comes in or the coaching comes in because I love folks who are passionate. They love what they do, but they don't have the business background. So. Very first and foremost, know what you need to earn and know what expenses you have to cover personally and the business side of things. That's great, thank you. Taylor? I'd love to jump in on that too. I think I can echo starting the groundwork of your business is definitely part one. You need to know who you are, what you're up to, and really make sure that in the future you're setting yourself up for success. With that said, I also believe that you're not alone knowing the right people and making sure that you bring those people on your team. You don't have to employ them. I just know them. Uh, make sure you have the right network and people that can support you on that journey because there are a lot of things that we will discuss tonight that aren't free and it's worth getting professionals in the room that will help you. Ben, yeah. Yeah, I would just add to that. I mean, some of the first things I'd want to know about, um, you know, this, this consultant coming in to speak with me is just, you know, what, what is the nature of your consulting business? I mean, are you doing anything that's going to be, you know, like I'm a consultant, right? Uh, you know, in the practice of law, um, 
you know, what that means is, you know, I expose myself to liability in terms of malpractice. People can sue me if I get it wrong. So what kind of consulting are you doing? Are you doing something in the medical field? Are you going to be touching people's bodies? Are you going to be operating machinery? Is there some kind of inherent risk? And then from there, we would kind of, you know, analyze your situation and see, okay, well, maybe this kind of business structure makes sense. Maybe uh, we'll need, you know, some insurance coverage, maybe some kind of combination, you know, thereof. But um, we're going to want to first, you know, need to understand what kind of risk is inherent in your consulting endeavor. And then you don't necessarily need to know all, you know, where you're going to be in five years, 10 years, but that's really going to dictate the legal and financial structure, you know, you're going to be operating with moving forward. That's great. Thank you. LW, anything to add to that one? I just think it's helpful um, not to be afraid of failure. I mean, I think in, in so many a facets of life, um, we just want to support you and lean in to taking those risks. I mean, yeah, this may not be a Silicon Valley, but it can be. You know, we want to have a community with one, one another where we're not really afraid of that, leaping into something that's unknown and kind of stretching yourself. And I think that's why we're here today is to, you know, have those conversations with you to know that it's okay to try something and not succeed the first time around. In fact, you may learn something brilliant that comes, you know, a few iterations down the line. So definitely encourage folks to take that leap. I really love what you said there as a marketer that speaks to the ethos of me. I always tell my team that, you know, we can't be afraid to try something. And if something fails, we learn from it and we move on quickly. Nicely done. So we're going to transition to another what if. This is really on the other end of the spectrum of running a small business. We're calling this one the coffee shop. In this scenario, you have been a business owner for the last 10 years as a coffee shop owner. You took over this business when you were 42 after working here for over 10 years. You cannot believe you spent the last 20 years working here, but it's your life and you love it. Who doesn't love the smell of coffee every day, right? It's a rather successful shop, although it's in a college area, so some lulls happen. Since you have been working here for so long, you know the business drought better than anyone, and you got really good at managing it. During one of the droughts, you're starting to think about, perhaps you should consider transitioning to saving for retirement. Do business owners even do that? Financial advisors, I'm looking at the two of you over here. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, there is that old adage about you have to pay yourself first, but it's definitely good when you've got that benefit for your employee base as well. And in all honesty, some of these plans um, can be starting kind of small. Um, you know, I think we think about it um, more from the standpoint of, you know, we're across the table from you trying to find something that's going to be the best fit. And I know trying to do that in a lean, mean way, you know, that doesn't break anybody's budget, um, but as a sharing and something that you can really see grow, I think is very motivational for us as well as employees who really just feel a part of it. And I've also seen um, businesses trying to transition more to like a co-op model or something where there's more shared ownership. So I think us sitting in this seat can kind of just help, you know, uh, I guess lift up a few of those little stones for you and see what's going to be the best fit for you guys growth and really I think that's kind of where it is because folks get motivated by different things in life and as you're starting to maybe transition out having somebody else incentivized to maybe take a different approach is a really good space to be. I like that. Thank you. Terrell, anything to add? Absolutely. Um, so it's funny in the business owner space one of the most common comments that and I'm pretty sure you hear it all the time I'm just going to sell the business that's my retirement plan. And it's like, oh, you cringe as an advisor, and you're just like, our biggest thing is your business is only worth what someone else is going to buy it for. So if other people don't see value in your business, you're not going to get the dollar that you think you're going to get. And most people who run the business, especially when you're passionate, you think your business is valued more than what it actually is. And so equate it to like your home. Right? We have emotional ties to our home. We've done this renovation. We fix, fix the furnace. We replace the roof. Those things don't increase the value. Those are just naturally what you have to do. So same idea with the business. Hey, it's a running business. It's all about the numbers. So you may not be in a position where you can actually sell your business. So thinking about what does that transition look like is also very important. Do you just simply want to sell the business and be gone? Do you have a key employee that might buy the business? Is it going to stay in the family? Um, those are two very different strategies when you're ultimately planning for retirement. A sell and uh, transition ultimately look at the financials very differently. And then also, is your business ready to be sold? Is somebody able to just step in and run the business? 
or do they have to transition? Is there going to be that time, that lull that they're going to go through? Because then your business isn't as valuable at that point if I have to put extra work in after I buy the business. So there's a lot of factors that you have to think about. Um, but to LW's point, it's important that you are saving along the way to make sure that you're creating that diversification of pools of money for retirement and not just relying on that, putting all your eggs in that basket to sell. That's great. Thank you. Ben, yeah. Yeah, and I would just kind of add to Terrell's point there. You know, so there's really two questions, right? You know, one is, you know, you're talking about retirement. So it's what you are going to be doing when you're done working. But then there's the question of what happens to the business. And, you know, to that end, you know, you know, there is some planning that's necessarily involved in that. You know, if, if you might have a plan to, oh, yeah, I'm going to pass, what is it, a coffee shop, right? A coffee shop onto, onto Junior. Well, what if Junior doesn't want the coffee shop, right? You know, and so there's that practical element too. Um, what if multiple kids want the coffee shop and you didn't plan accordingly? There, that could create some family squabbling as well. And so there is that, you know, that kind of that communication within the family so you know how to proceed. Do you sell uh, or should we go see an attorney talk about how, you know, you make sure that your estate planning documents are in harmony with your business documents so that there can be such a seamless transition. And just quickly, I'm not a financial advisor by any means, so it won't be that long. But don't sell yourself short in a sense that a lot of the businesses, especially locally, aren't a Walmart or a Target. The coffee shop is going to be cyclical. We live in a very college-heavy town. So don't sell yourself short in a cash flow sense because you are managing it and have been managing it. So just share that knowledge with your financial advisor and your attorney, and they'll help you out, help you make a good decision. Get that team like you were talking about to start. Yeah, I think that's so true. And and business succession planning, I think, is a really important topic. I mean, even at the credit union, as a leader, we're always thinking ahead of, of the next five and 10 years and who may be retiring and who, who, who can we be grooming to maybe take over that role. I think that's something always to be looking at. And, you know, LW, you mentioned the cooperative model, too. I think that's been a really interesting use case in the Pioneer Valley. I'm thinking downtown sounds in, in Northampton who turned in from a, a single owner to a worker co-op. So um, there are a lot of options out there to explore. Perfect. Well, we made it through our what if scenarios and we're actually going to switch gears here. Uh, sort of an interesting topic, um, not finance related, but I think really important when you think about running a small business. I know I've chatted with a few folks in the audience here tonight and, and the conversation is often, you know, I'm wearing a lot of different hats, right? And so this topic is more about wellness. And so the question is, what would your advice be to your clients if they came to you and mentioned health and mental wellness? as they juggle with the ins and outs of running a small business. This happens to me a lot. As a business relationship manager, I see a lot of businesses at all times of their life. Um, so I'll jump in. Ultimately, we're all humans. We are not superheroes. And I think as a business owner, it's, or just anybody in general with a specialty, it's really easy to think that we all can wear every hat. But at the end of the day, burnout is so real. So when thinking about that, just knowing your strengths and going back to that foundation that Terrell was talking about in that first question, making sure that you kind of have that brand, if you will, and you kind of have that value proposition. Remember what your values are and take those values forward and allow yourself to open the doors to help. And that doesn't even mean hiring somebody, but perhaps just opening your doors to a professional, just getting a second opinion. It might even grow your business beyond lengths you didn't even know. Thanks, Taylor. Anyone else? Yeah. So I think health and wellness is crucial for all of us as human beings. And I think COVID opened it up and made it less um, taboo to think about therapy. And therapy is something that mental health is just as beneficial for you as physical wellness and things of that nature. So ultimately, it's important as a person to be okay. And so when you think about being a business owner, now you're to Taylor's point, wearing all of these hats and you're thinking about everything you have to do with the business, you're juggling a lot. So if you're not taking care of your personal health, that is going to show up in your business. And we see it very, very often with business owners who are reactive versus proactive because they're just responding to everything that's happening to them. So it is important that you take that time out for yourself. And it's just like the, what do we see on the, the plane? Put your ask, oxygen mask on first before you're helping somebody else. Make sure you're taking care of yourself first, 
before you're focusing on the business because if you're not well, neither is your business. If you have employees, that is going to flow to the employees. So if you're not taking care of yourself, that is going to truly show in you create the environment for your staff. Um, there's a really good book that I read. It's The Gap and the Gain from uh, Dan Sullivan and Dr. Benjamin Hardy. And I love the concept because it takes us, most of us as business owners, we're always looking forward and we're looking at what we have not achieved yet. So we set our goals, we're like, oh, I made a million dollars, but I was hoping for a million too. Instead of saying, wow, last year I made $100,000 and now I made a million. So it's a mindset shift and the book really gets you to measure backwards and it gets you to focus on what are your wins every single day. So it really changes your mindset. So as a business owner, you really start to see all the good that you're doing and don't stress on the crap that we put on ourselves. And it, I personally have just started to embrace it. So it's a, it's a big mindset shift and I truly appreciate it because every day you really like, Oh, wow. Like, how many wins did I actually have today? Even though everything didn't go perfectly. But then those things that don't go well, you look at them very differently. Instead of beating yourself up, you start to think, all right, how could I have gotten a little bit better to make that a win? So I highly recommend that book for business owners. I love that perspective. Yeah, even um, I'm just thinking about UMass 5. I mean, something we're trying to get better at, a bigger you know, institution is celebrating successes. We're, we're the same way. It, it's not just small business owners. I think just people who are running organizations of all shapes and sizes are just always focused on that next hoop to jump through and, and just really taking time to reflect on how far you've come is so important. Ben. Yeah, just to add to that, and, and I feel like you, you know, Terrell, you, you're talking about taking care of yourself. And I, mean, I thought you were, I thought he was, you know, giving me a guilt trip for skipping the gym tonight, you know, because <laughs> I'm here. So, not, no, but just to add on to more broadly on wellness, um, you know, another thing to think of that's often overlooked with business owners is, you know, what if something happens to you that renders you in a state where you're unable to, um, you know, manage your business, you know, uh, or even, you know, even if temporarily, you know, and namely if you're you know, deemed incapacitated, right? And so you're gonna to wanna to consider naming someone with a power of attorney that authorizes that individual to take care of your financial affairs. You know, so just think about a scenario of your chief cook and bottle washer for your business. You know, what if you're incapacitated? Who's going to process payroll, uh, conduct routine transactions and so forth? And so that could really paralyze the operations of a small business if you're not, you know, kind of thinking about um, kind of just your own health and, you know, the ramifications of um, not having those systems in place. Yeah, I think it's an important consideration. LW, anything to add? I've been in this position where I felt like my hair was on fire. Um, starting out at Scotty's, you know, I had somebody that I bought the business from, and this was after about five years almost of looking for a business that I thought would be a good fit for me, and it was something I wanted to do that was outside. That's really what compelled me to buy Scotty's, and I noticed when I would get in my most um, pinpoint, freak out, I think I'm going to lose it moments, it was usually in the kitchen. It's really hot in there. It's really tight, really confining, and I noticed when I took a time out and thank goodness we have machinery outside that I can run and operate safely <laughs> and it's the ball picker or it's the lawnmower and for me just being in the moment and understanding kind of where you are when you're in one of those crisis points and certainly being there in that crisis point I know just being that awareness of kind of taking a time out for yourself is really important too and can kind of clear your head get a little bit more of what's going to be really the good next step and I think that's you know so important as we are really wearing a lot of different hats and you know we're not bulletproof and things happen all the time that are just going to be the unknown, the wild, wild west as a business owner. And there's just not enough that all of us up here can say about those things because they're just going to be different and some unusual one-off you're never going to have heard for, from before. Um, but just to know that you do, you know, being present, being grounded, and then things can always kind of come, you can come back to something even though it doesn't seem in the moment like you can, but just to give yourself that grace. I really love that. Find your time out. I think everyone kind of has that thing to lean on, whether it's, you know, going outside. If you're an exercise enthusiast, talk to Taylor and I after because we, we do a lot out on the Peloton sometimes. So you got to find that. Thank you all. Um, all right. So moving on to our next topic, uh, thinking about awareness generation for a local business. Uh, so that could be marketing. That could be networking. We're going to start on the marketing side of the house. 
Um, so this question is, many of you see a wide range of businesses in your day-to-day -day with different techniques of marketing and advertising. From your experiences, what are some low, no-cost ways to help spread the word about your business? I'll start there. It's a two-parter. Ben. I mean, I think, you know, number one would, would probably be even like, you know, really low cost, specifically cheap, uh, you know, free, like, uh, you know, is provide a good, you know, service, uh, product experience, whatever it is you're doing. Um, you know, there's really no substitute for a, you know, a walking, talking, you know, billboard for you. Right. And so just, um, let your, let what you do, you know, speak for itself and just totally commit to it. Every client, every customer, whatever the case may be, uh, that leaves your office, your store, um, could be singing your praises. So, you know, start right. Don't look beyond that really, uh, for these, for starters. Yeah. Taylor. I agree with Ben laying the groundwork for your business is everything. Having people walking and talking as a billboard is also everything. Word of mouth is the key, cheapest and best marketing tool. Um, but with that said, social media is also a great tool. And often people aren't using it really to the full capacity that you could. But when you do, just make sure that you lean into your brand in a way that makes sense for your brand. Don't fake it to make it on social because people do see that. Um, so really make sure that you're doing it because you want to do it and it makes you feel good and it leans into your business and the groundwork will speak for itself and the social will support it. I love in combination of what you're both saying. I mean, even at UMass five as, as the head of marketing, that's a lot of what we've been focusing on ourselves is, is letting our members tell our story. So finding those people who are really passionate about having good experiences with us and allowing that to happen authentically. I think that makes a lot of sense. LW. Uh, you came to the right place really to get the answer to this question because the chamber here has so many wonderful individuals that just deeply care about the business community, LGBTQ community, this area of Massachusetts and the whole state and, and the region. And honestly, you know, the networking that we can do, whether it's events like this or, you know, other events that we host, or even just supporting one another by going to one another's businesses or reaching out to one another to leverage those services or just have a cup of coffee. I think this is why there's really a good value here in this room. And so that to me is one of the low hanging fruits of just finding those conversations and making that a point, especially when when you're brand new or starting out or thinking about pivoting to something different. Hmm. Yeah, and that actually dovetails a bit into uh, another question. Um, we'll get back to you one second, yeah. one other one, but in terms of networking, are there any tips and tricks that you all feel as a good strategy for a small business? Because I think it's, it's sort of the same conversation of, you know, you're trying to balance and carve out that me time for mental wellness, but how are you actually going and attending an event on top of all that as well? I I'd just add, uh, I really would just schedule the time. I know it sounds nuts to do when you've got a zillion things, and I felt kind of nuts about trying to do it. Um, but I just noticed, you know, certain events happen these particular times, and I would just literally force myself to time block it and work with somebody, um, you know, on my staff to cover for me if I needed to. I just had to make it in my calendar every single time to go and, and just be my best self when I came, even if I got shy. <laughs> I like that. If it's not in my calendar, it's not happening is what I've learned. <laughs> ben? Yeah, I would just add, you know, just in terms of networking, I mean, don't, I mean, it, make, it's what you want to make of it, right? You know, so what is networking to you? I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be going to a, something that's, you know, build as a quote unquote networking event, right? I mean, it could be um, hanging out with your, um, with your friends or colleagues, what have you. Um, but just, you know, it, you're just talking about what you're doing. I mean, the point of networking really is just to kind of be in front of people, remind people that you have a business, remind them what you do. Uh, hopefully, you know, you're developing relationships. Eventually, there'll be synergies that come out of that. Um, but really, just networking is what you make of it. You don't have to go to a networking event uh, to call it networking. Um, it, you know, it could really could be, um, you know, it could be going to your church, any other you know, kind of sporting uh, group that you might have. Um, and so just whenever you're as a business owner, just remember that kind of whenever you're talking with someone, you're some you're more or less on, right? You this could be a marketing opportunity, even though you're talking with someone you already know or I have networked with in the past. Right. And and maybe to get back to marketing too, do do you think marketing versus network is it one or the other? Is one more important or is it is it always both? Yeah. 
But yeah, definitely always both. Um, and I'll, I want to piggyback on uh, LW's comment about the Chamber. The Chamber is an amazing resource, and there's so many free resources out there for business owners. So definitely do a little research, and you can get some support for marketing. Um, and another shout out to the Chamber, the B program. It's a free program, provides free cho uh, coaching, free legal service, free accounting service, free marketing service. So all of these are there for you for free. You have to just do the work, fill out the application, show up to those meetings, but there's opportunities to get marketing very inexpensive or, in this case, very free. Um, I'm not a huge networker person. That's not my thing. I'm usually more introverted to myself, but it's one of those things. You are a business owner. You are your business, and you need to speak your business, so you have to be out there. Um, but being out there also challenges you. Can you articulate your business well? Is your 30-second commercial on point? Because if it's not, get your butt back out there and keep <laughs> saying it. So to your point, yes, you, you are your brand. I love, um, there was a study shown how old-fashioned, we used to work for a single company for 30 years, they took care of us. That's not the case anymore. And so it talked about branding. And ultimately, we're so used to company brands, but we forget that we are our own brand. So it's not, companies actually don't look at individuals saying, hey, you just had five jobs in the last 10 years, like what's going on? They're like, all right, what did you get from it? So if you sell your brand, you, well enough, I got this experience in X, Y, and Z, you're doing the same thing as a business owner. You are your own brand. And now as a business owner, you can connect to larger corporations and understand that. So are you articulating yourself well? All of you are here, right? You're networking, you're making those connections. Are you articulating your story well? And if you're not, get better at it. I think that's a homework assignment for all of us tonight is to go home and work on our elevator speech. It's so true though. Taylor, any other thoughts? Yeah, definitely. I think the moral of the story up here for sure is be intentional, um, but also be make it impactful, make it meaningful to you. You could go to a chamber event and meet 20 people every time and be super strategic and figure out the list of who has the most connections on LinkedIn or who knows everybody, who knows everybody. You could do that all day, but it just doesn't feel, uh, it just doesn't feel like you at the end of the day. And how you feel and how you make your connections, that meaning and that purpose is, it just reflects your business. And that's that pitch, you know, you learn that from talking to people, sure. But talking to the right people, you definitely understand what people are more curious by when they start asking more questions. I think that's so very true, yeah. And and I think, um, you know, just to re-harp on something I mentioned earlier too, just you gotta be not afraid to try different things as well too, because sometimes you could have a crazy idea and put it out there and it could fall totally flat. And then the next time you could try it and and tweak it just the slightest bit and you've really found something. Um, so I always like to, to say, you know, make sure that you're, you're trying different items with marketing and networking and, and finding that combination. Really quickly too, I just wanna add what LW said about making time for like going for coffee or going for a beer or something. That is where you will meet the person who will help you the most. Um, so definitely don't forget to do that as much as it does take time out of your calendar you will learn everything you need to know in one hour with that person. Yeah. I'm in a coaching program now and there's a concept of integration. And it talks about instead of creating this idea of balance, right? Balance your personal life for it with your professional life. Um, and she says like, basically what is that? That's a 50-50, so you're failing here and you're failing here. And so her concept is integrate the two. So how can you integrate your personal life with your professional life? So um, I'll pick on Taylor. Taylor is a kickball queen, and so we learned that about. But why not connect? So for Taylor, she loves doing that. She's already there, so why not mingle around and find other business owners that she can ultimately support on that. So now that's a win-win in the sense of like that's personal time, something she loves to do, but potential business that she can find. So how can you marry those two, things that you love to do, but also pull in the business component of it? That's great perspective, yeah, thank you. Awesome. All right, we're gonna move on uh, to some business best practices for this series of questions. So the first one here, as a small business owner, it can be tempting to do it all alone, as we've been talking about. 
What are some strategies a small business owner can take when weighing what functions to hire for, to outsource, or to continue to perform themselves? So knowing everyone's juggling, knowing there are some resources out there, what's the right approach to take, what's the right approach to take when navigating that? Yeah, Terrell. So another book along the same authors, um, Who Not How, and this was a beautiful concept for me. Stop asking yourself, how are you going to do all these things? And start asking yourself, who can help you achieve those items? And ultimately, when you start thinking about that, your mindset shifts and the stress comes off. Oh, I don't have to do all of this. Who can support me? So Angie's a great resource for Western Mass. And so, <laughs> hey, questions, that's a first stop. Angie might know somebody who can be my who. The other piece of it in this space is we teach our business owners, I'm pretty sure you have the same conversation of working in your business versus working on your business. So I like to say, are you the employee or are you the employer? And that goes back to the networking. Networking is being the employer, making those connections for your business. That is working on the business to expand it. So when you think about all of these tasks that have to happen, you can't be there forever. You're going to wear the CFO hat, the CEO hat, the COO hat. You're going to do all of that in the beginning, but you can't do it forever if you're going to expand. Every business owner runs into this, I don't have the money to do it. So sometimes can't be afraid to fail. You have to take that leap of faith, and sometimes you're going to fail. You're going to be in debt because you made the wrong decision. But as you get better at it, you start to analyze, essentially, when is it the right move to hire? When is it the right move to find a contractor? When is it the right move to find those professionals? I'll give you an example. I was coaching a, um, a client, um, and she's dealing with insurance payments. And so they're always backlogged. They don't want to pay. So her um, administrative assistant is spending so much time there. And we had the conversation. Does it make sense to have your staff member doing this or to outsource it? And her issue is, well, they're going to get a cut of pay from it, a percentage. But then the same concept is you're paying this employee to do the same thing. So weigh that out. It, does it make sense to keep that in-house? Does it make sense to outsource it? So that's when you put your business, ha ha uh, sorry, business owner hat on and start to make those business owner decisions. And that is a big decision. She has to do that analysis to say, where is it more cost effective? But also she has to, I gave her some homework. They're going to do job roles and that um, employee, we're going to find out if she actually likes doing it. Mm -hmm. If she likes doing it, then maybe we need to actually fire, uh, hire a part-time assistant to pick up additional duties. So it, there's no magic book for this. You have to figure it out on your own. But again, don't be afraid to take that leap of faith and fail occasionally, um, but also constantly think who, not how. And pro cons lists can be big with that decision making, <laughs> right? I'm a big write it down type of person. <laughs> ben, you had something to say? Yeah, a couple things. Um, you know, first of all, you know, obviously context is everything, right? So for some businesses, you know, the, the big decision before you might be, you know, how do I go about hiring my first employee? Uh, for, for other businesses, you know, the big question is how do I hire my next 10, right? So, you know, the context is always important, but you always want to look at, you know, what is it that you're going to want your, you know, this employee to do or what do you need help with, right? And so, you know, for example, if it's something that's going to deal with, you know, uh, uh, you know, one of your secret sauces of your business, you know, maybe a non-disclosure agreement might be in order, right? Um, maybe, um, you know, employment contracts might be in order. Um, if you're going to be hiring someone to deal with your financials, you know, I would be leery, for, you know, personally about, you know, having someone having unfettered access to everything. So you may not want to hire a bookkeeper and say, thanks very much for keeping me afloat. Maybe they can do their thing, but you're going to want to make sure you're reconciling those accounts or having some kind of oversight uh, to make sure that, you know, an employee doesn't have complete and unfettered control over everything. Um, you know, another thing along those lines is data security issues. That's a huge problem these days. And so you're going to want to make sure that you're protected to the extent that you're, you know, to the extent, you know, you're taking customers' information, uh, you know, hopefully they're paying you, right? You don't want to, you want to make sure that, you know, your employees um, are safeguarding, you know, your, um, your customers, you know, financial information, per other personal information. And so you just want to think about, you know, kind of those security uh, mechanisms. That's great. Taylor? 
Yeah, I think it's easy to lose sleep over these kind of things at night, right? You're sitting in bed and you just are running over every idea. I think we all do that. But leaning into those coffee conversations, have a mentor, a business mentor. They don't have to be in the same field. Sometimes it's the most creative ideas that really uplift your business and change your mindset. And maybe, like, I mean, we all know we've been through the pandemic. It changed our mindset. We had to move things to digital. Nobody really thought that that would ever happen. But at the end of the day, we all came together. We all talked about how we were going to do it, and we did it. So it's all about coming together. Don't let that drive you crazy and keep you up at night because we're all dealing with our own little things and just sharing is half the battle. I think that's so true. And just knowing that you can pivot, I think is something that, you know, it, it does, is in line with failing fast in many ways, but knowing that you can take a shift if, if you didn't make a right decision. Yeah. LW, anything to add? I just think, you know, we're up here to be that help, that helpful hand. So if you don't know what a CBA is or cost benefit analysis or, you know, any other kind of um, feasibility study, you know, we can kind of help with some of that stuff. Just like I said, over the cup of coffee or something. And it's just a matter of kind of thinking through knowing your worth versus what, what the outsourcing model might provide. And that's, you know, again, some services that we can help you with. Great. Thank you. Um, moving on to another question, um, we all know cash flow is probably one of the most critical components of running a small business, right? And uh, with the experts that we have in the room here, uh, the question is, what are some best practices you can provide the audience regarding ways to stay on top of their cash flow? So I learned this back when I was working at the restaurant. And I didn't realize at the time that it was very valuable, but as I've grown into my role at the credit union, I'm seemingly noticing that people don't do this. But you should be running monthly reports on your finances, not just your income or your revenue or anything in between. You should know inventory if you have it. You should know cost of goods sold if you have it. Um, every report that you can, you should see it, and you should see where the numbers are changing and where they make sense and just kind of getting that viewpoint it will help with the cash flow for sure because it will tell you where your business is doing well and where it's not doing well labor costs that is something that you definitely want to analyze against your sales uh, make sure that you're doing great with that because you might realize by doing your monthly analytics that you don't need a body or you need another body and labor costs would be the first thing you could look at so monthly reporting hands down is my first thought Thanks, Taylor. Ben, you know, one you know for folks who aren't necessarily uh, you know f you know financially inclined or, or you know kind of struggle with the accounting or numbers things along those lines. I mean, one, one tactic that works for some folks is you know having you know isolated bank accounts, and so rather than having you know say one you know operating business account where money is deposited, that's where you spend money from, you know maybe you'll want to you know. As you get money in, you know, you want to set aside a tax account, right? Unfortunately, we're going to have to pay taxes as we make money. And so, you know, you know that, you know, you can work with your accountant and know, okay, in my situation, I know roughly 28, 30%, whatever is going to go to taxes. So let's just put that in, in an escrow account, if you will, right? Just pretend it's going away somewhere else. So you're not kind of, so you, so you don't see that in your account every day. Similarly, you know, some folks will say, okay, you know, my, you know, I have $1,000 in rent this month and, you know, whatever, $3,000 on payroll, what have you, but you add all that up and say, okay, boom, put that into account. That's, that's my monthly expenditures. And so you can watch that go down. If you're going over budget, that's one mechanism where you can have kind of instant visibility. Obviously, ideally, you're going to want, you know, probably some kind of software, certainly if you're, you're you know, the, you know, more complicated your business is, that'll tell you this information. But again, if you're not financially inclined or you struggle with interpreting financial reports, that could be at least one starting point uh, with some guidance from your accountant, just kind of setting up maybe a half a dozen different accounts uh, for uh, specific uses. I think that's really smart. LW? And just to build off of that, I love that Ben, you know, mentioned having the separate accounts. Um, you know, there's certain things as you're as you're going in to build your business um, 
that you do start to find out about yourself that you probably weren't aware of before. And so, you know, it's kind of some of those things that might haunt you. And I know I jumped for joy when I got my first bookkeeper for Scotty's, because again, so many hats on our heads. Um, but one of the things, you know, we're new in the year. Um, if you're thinking about starting a business or you've been kind of wondering if you're a little off on managing it, um, I love having the conversation with you about just kind of getting down to basics. And I know, you know, you mentioned this before about the, the budgeting and there's, you know, some principles, maybe it's a Ramsey method or, you know, snowball method or whatever they call it or just envelope method where you can kind of try um, something new and keeping some money set aside. I know the other principle that I wanted to share was just this notion, like in personal finance, we talk about it about building up an emergency fund. And so for your business, it's also important um, to have some set aside that you can um, utilize or line item. I know when I started um, this past season at Scotty's, I had a set amount of money in the account so that I knew if I didn't have that amount, was I checking against, you know, just knowing that that baseline was in there. Um, so it could be just something a little bit more simple where you try the envelope method or you try kind of the baseline method. But I know having that little bit of an emergency fund certainly helps you feel better at night, sleep a little bit better at night, just knowing you're not going to bounce anything. With that tactic, just knowing Scotty's is so seasonal, does does that come into play a lot for your business as well, I would think? Oh, my heavens, yes. I mean, the surprise electric bills and things like that, you just want, I just wanted to die, especially this past year. Um, and, and I think, you know, some of what we do, um, you know, we can kind of be in our own way. And I've just noticed, boy, I gave a lot to that bookkeeper. I was really happy when she found some cash in an envelope. <laughs> I'm like, what kind of financial advisor am I? But, um, it, you know, it does tend to kind of get away from you, you know, at times, just because we're busy or we're in a habit of just putting stuff in something in an envelope. And, you know, I think um, being true to ourselves, we're never going to have everything perfectly solved, but it's you know, leaning on somebody that can just be a second set of eyes and never being afraid of just saying, you know, I don't know this. And I certainly know I've had to have people just check this for me. You know, you get busy and thinking about things that you need to do that are, you know, priorities. <laughs> this one's fallen, you know, lower and lower on the totem pole, but it is really important. And I think too, I never really realized um, before I owned my own business, you know, that it kind of has its own credit, its own credit score. Certainly mine's important, you know, I'm on the hook for a lot of things. Um, but, you know, just knowing that, you know, when we think of personal credit, we also have to encapsulate there could be some business credit. And I know this is, you know, an area of expertise here for Taylor. So knowing that you can, like for me, I thought, let me see about a home equity loan before things change. Um, let me see about another business credit card, another personal credit card, just to have something. May not need it, may not even take it out of the envelope, but you know, being more aware, I guess, of what some of those avenues are, um, you know, and then knowing that you can leverage them as you need to. Does that make sense? It really does, and I think to relate back to something you said earlier, there's a little bit of the who, not the how there too. Yeah. Anything else on your yeah, side? Sure. I'll echo really what everybody said. And my biggest thing for folks is the separation. There's so many times that we see business owners and everything is in one pot. And so because of that, they tell us it's like, oh, well, I am the business and the business is me. So the money coming in is paying my expenses and vice versa. Any savings I have goes back to the business. And so especially in the startup space, it is so important that you separate. And so, so many clients were like, I don't have the cash flow to have a business account. That's fine. It's a checking account and we call it our own mental business account. And that's perfectly fine. But that separation is so, so important because you need to see the cash flow of the business and you need to see your personal cash flow. And so I make clients open those extra accounts. And so all of the business income comes into that checking account specifically for the business and the expenses for the business come out. And when they pay themselves, that is an expense to the business. Remember, if you are taking a draw from your business, you are an expense to your business. So don't forget that. Now your personal side, just like you would pay an employee, has their own bank accounts. So when you pay yourself, you're over here and now your personal expenses. So many times do I see the business owner, oh yeah, I just put that on my credit card. That is a business expense. So is it being paid from the business account? No, I'm paying it out of my cash flow. No, you're not truly tracking how the business is essentially performing. And especially when you grow and we get to the larger corporation size, you really need that separation. So you want to create these good habits super early in that business career. 
And again, it's really tracking how is that cash flow. And so many times we see it where the business has done great, especially the cyclical businesses, where it's like, oh my God, the summer was amazing. We just made six figures in like three months. And now we're spending six figures in the next four months. And now the winter hits. And now they're in a crappy spot and they're like, crap, can I keep this business going? Can I hold it until we get to the next season? So by separating those and paying yourself on that regular basis, you can see how well you're doing. And especially for the seasonal, you have to save that much more to keep paying those businesses. So do you have enough revenue coming in for those months? And by creating that separation, you can see the expenses and you can start to map out for that full year. The other piece of it, start to see your patterns. Every business, every individual. So I, on the financial planning side, we do this with individuals where we create the what we call a three-account system, and so they track all of their expenses in their checking account. Make sure they deposit, ideally, the same amount in that checking account every single month, but now they're tracking. So, and I always use myself as an example. So my husband's birthday is in October. We host Thanksgiving in uh, November, and then we travel in December. So... My cash flow at the end of the year is crap. And then it's like, then January, February, March, it's just build up. But now I know my patterns. So now I know I need to hunker down January, February, March and really ramp up in the business. So now when I'm grinding in the business, it's taking the stress that normally would be there out because I already know I'm prepping for next fall when it's going to be a lot more expenses coming down the pipeline. So separation is key. If I could just circle back to all of this, the monthly reporting would be great to recognize those monthly things that happen. You can look back. It's like, ooh, last November we spent a lot of money on turkey. That makes sense, you know, and you lose sight of that when it's a business. Um, but with that said, business credit, uh, it's not just the credit score. A business lender is going to look at your money management skills, and they absolutely will want to see you making sure you have all of the financials in order, not necessarily the bank account, although we will look, uh, primarily just those financial documents to make sure that you have your ducks in a row and you know what you're talking about. So business credit isn't just the credit score. Uh, definitely think about your reporting. Think about how you track your finances because that will make you more bankable. It's a really great point. In terms of expenses, this is more my genuine curiosity than anything else, but how important is it to understand your fixed expenses versus your variable? Can anyone speak to that? <laughs> that is absolutely everything. So I'm actually writing a book now about the three account system. Oh, wow. And so ultimately we stress the budget and the fixed expenses, they're easy. They're to the point, your mortgage, your rent, your, um, installment debt so car loans things of that nature so that's just easy when we think about those variable expenses especially in the business owner space we can really hurt ourselves in a single month if we don't prepare properly so when I have my clients on the individual side do their budget we inflate all of those variable expenses and so on the business owner side it's just as important because there is no single month where your expenses are exactly the same none because of, just think of electricity, food, gas, anything like that is going to fluctuate month to month. So you want to make sure you get an idea of what that average is for the year and inflate it. And just know, as everybody's experienced inflation, things keep going up. So the more you inflate that, the better your budget is going to look. You're basically building in a buffer for those incidental emergencies, which you ultimately can't predict. And what LW said before is like that emergency saving. So in that three account system, our small savings is for those incidentals. Things just pop up. The coffee machine in the coffee shop breaks and it's like, oh my God, there's a $500 repair right there. Easy. All right. But now our plumbing went completely haywire and now that's a $3,000 expense. That's more of our bigger emergency. So we create this separation of those two. So again, when we allocate what needs to come into that expense account, that billing account, we know what should be ideally coming in is more than what we need because we created that buffer. So great question. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you. I'm just taking a quick look at time. We're, we're moving right through. So um, we actually just have one closing question from my deck of cards here, and then we'll see if the audience has any other questions. Um, but 
We'll close with this. Um, so panelists, if you were going to give a new business owner your top piece of advice, maybe something that we haven't touched on already tonight, what would that be? Anyone like to kick us off? Ben. I might be admittedly cheating somewhat here, but hear me out if I may. You, you, I don't know if you can control my mic over there, Craig. You can cut me off. But, uh, but Terrell spoke just a moment ago about, um, you know, you know, separating your accounts, you know, having that, you know, that firewall, if you will, between yourself and your business. Um, the, I, I just want to double down on that piece of advice. I mean, you know, Terrell was talking about that from a, um, you know, a financial standpoint, right, in terms of um, analyzing your cash flow and your spending, et cetera. But um, it's absolutely critical if you are operating your business, you know, through an entity, you know, a lot of folks use LLCs or if it's a corporate entity, if you're just commingling your personal funds in, with entity funds, you know, you can get to a point where there's really no legal distinction between yourself and your business. What does that mean? If something happens, uh, let's just say you have a disgruntled employee, uh, a vendor, um, you know, wh whatever, uh, anyone who's filed a lawsuit against you, a creditor, um, they can go after your personal assets, and that's not a joke. Um, if you're, if you're, if just because you filed an end, uh, for an LLC, you know, three years ago, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're that you're golden, right? If you haven't maintained the entity properly, if you haven't treated it with the integrity that it deserves, that it needs to be valid. So remember why we get LLCs, why we get these corporate entities in the first place. It's oftentimes for that liability shield. And that liability shield will absolutely disappear if there's that co-mingling of funds. So, uh, you know, my number one piece of advice is if you, have a, if you have a business entity and you're running your business through that entity, have that firewall, that legal firewall between you as a business owner and you as an individual. That's critical, thank you. I just wanted to jump in and I noticed suddenly that we don't have an insurance person up here. So um, in their absence, I would say, you know, it's never a bad idea to get to know your insurance guy and just understand a little bit more about what the coverages are that are out there. Sometimes the business owner's policy you know, can be kind of woven to and tailored more or a little bit more generic. But to your point about some of those liabilities, I think it's really important. Um, to know that that is going to be a good, solid business expense, even especially when you're branching into something new that's a little unknown for you. Thanks, LW. Taylor? Uh, I'm struggling on choosing the best advice. Um, what comes to mind first is the business plan is going to change, so just let it change. Um, make sure that it sticks to your true values. Um, but with that aside, your network is everything at the end of the day. That meaningful network is going to take you so far if you rely on it and you pay it forward by doing the same. Uh, you're not alone. We are not superheroes. Uh, we are in a community that is great and everybody here wants to help you. Uh, so let them. That's great. Thank you. Terrell, you want to close this out? <laughs> <laughs> sure thing. Um, so when I think about that question, I think about ultimately begin with the end in mind. What is your end goal? And so we get, I challenge my business owners, like, what is your goal? How are you going to exit this business? Because ultimately, depending on how, it, and to Taylor's point, things change. So it doesn't have to be, it's not a Bible, it's a roadmap. Um, but if you start with the end in mind, then you know what you're doing here to get to that point. So again, is it the goal to sell it? Is the goal to pass it to an employee that's passionate? Is it the goal to keep it in a family? You're gonna do different things depending on ultimately what that end goal is. And so it makes it a little bit easier when you're building your professional team. Like as an advisor, it's important for us to know where are we going. And so sometimes we'll get business owners like, oh, I'm just going to see how it goes. Well, that's really not a business. That's a hobby. You're doing this for fun if you really don't have a direction. So if you're truly engaging in business, be a business owner. And again, how are you going to leave that business? It's hard for many people to think about it because they have to think about all the hard trials and tribulations they're going to go through to get to that end point. But if you think about it, again, at the very beginning, you can navigate that roadmap. You can make the twists and turns and not feel overly stressed because you know what your end goal is. And again, you can build that professional team that's so important, the legal, the accounting, the advisors, to help you achieve that. Because again, if it's just a passion that you just want to keep the lights on at home, 
there's a lot less overhead that you have to spend on that business versus if you really want to grow and leave that legacy to another generation, there's a lot more work and a lot more legal and accounting that you really need to put into that business to get it to the right place. So I think I'm going to add to the homework about the elevator pitch. It's also about finding that guiding star and that goal that you can reflect back on as when you're in those moments of overwhelmed by the, you know, repair bill that came out of nowhere or the electricity bill that went up. I think that's so true. Um, audience, I'll, I'll turn to the group. I don't know if anyone has any questions um, that they've thought about. We do have a couple of questions, I yeah. believe, that came in via the Zoom. Uh, Mel, do you, wanna, do you want me to give you the mic? <laughs> I mean, I, I guess that's an easy one for me. I, I, I was an accounting major in college. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, look, every, how, how often, I think every one of us uh, mentioned the word accounting and probably every answer tonight or something close to it. So, I mean, some kind of introductory uh, accounting class and then, you know, you know, usually college will have, you know, kind of progressions from there if you want to, if you really want to go down that path. I think economics. Uh, it's just super cyclical out there and things change all the time, so economics would be where I'd head. It's not my favorite. <laughs> that was no, my no. major. <laughs> it's just knowing how things work and, you know, what drives demand. Uh, I think we saw a lot of that in COVID, you know, and yeah. paper towels instead of toilet paper, right? Yeah, what drives, you know? Um, I have another question Oh, well. my, um, um, I was told you need to use the microphone in oh, order I'm for, so yeah, I didn't realize that. Um, any advice on prepping for a PFML? Paid family medical leave? P PFML? Is this any advice on prepping for one? So I'm going to assume this as a business owner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So from my understanding for the PFML, um, ultimately we all pay it when we get paid a W-2. So the company has two choices, basically pay into the state plan or basically provide insurance. So they're going to an outside vendor for it. So as a business owner, you can just simply opt into the state plan. And that's the simplest way per se, but there is the option to basically take on the insurance as a business owner yourself. Thank you so much. Just to follow up on that, um, as a business owner, I used a couple of different payroll providers and was really fortunate to have them do that work for me to make sure that that always got filed on time because there definitely are some severe penalties and I've had clients um, who have had account freezes and different things, repercussions after COVID, I think, or during COVID, maybe the state wasn't taking as much action on something that maybe was filed late, but I definitely have had uh, several situations where um, this came somewhat out of nowhere for folks. I mean, maybe they did know it or they just didn't admit it, but you know, it's tough too when you've got so many of the new legislation to have that payroll provider um, who can provide some support in those ways and you can kind of lean into them sometimes for a little HR support and other things. Anyone from the, oh, here we go. Hi, thanks everyone for being here. Um, I'm a big fan of what you're saying about you know finding the right people to support you and not trying to wear all the hats. I don't like hats. <laughs> um, and I'm a solopreneur and a lot of what you're talking about though is really kind of sensitive stuff like whether it's law or the finances and so there's a trust that you as a business owner I would hope to build. So I'm curious, you, know, you talk a lot about values and kind of wellness and, and ma making those connections. So coming from either your seat of meeting with a business owner and also from the business owner's perspective, how do you do that values check or how do you recommend um, to find out if there's an alignment? Because for example, you were talking about burnout and workplace wellness and you know, I don't want to sit down with someone and get into a business relationship and have them be like, you know, just push through and just keep, you know, da da, and be like, whoa, we are not on the same page. And so, like, how do you check that in the 
beginning or how would you recommend? I don't think there's an easy answer for how to check it, but I think the best thing to rely on is you choose who you work with and who works with you. Uh, You do not have to sit down and go back to that banker if you didn't have the vibe with them. Uh, Same with the attorney. You choose where to put your money and we all do too as consumers. So I I don't think there's a good answer on how to make sure that you are reading the room together, um, but know your worth and you don't have to go back to somebody just because you feel bad. Yeah, I really appreciate that question a lot. Um, I think it's something that I I struggled with just personally, um, becoming a financial advisor, making sure my values were aligned with any firm that I got aligned with. Um, But I also think um, just as a human being sitting across the room from somebody, there's just untold levels of vulnerability. And I really want to honor each and every point in that. And sometimes the conversations are so hard that I take this with me home and think about I'm going to be meeting them again in two weeks, three weeks, four weeks time and making sure I am really careful with they need to do a lot of prep. We really need to work on this together. We really are a team. We're really, you know, kind of locking arms here um, because sharing some of this stuff, especially when it's around the failures or the struggles. um, And I've had clients that have, you know, Personally, you know, you look at maybe their income statement and say, you guys should be all set. But you know what? It isn't true. It isn't true. There's a lot of different things out there that are happening, whether it's, you know, wanting to chase a dream. And so we're, we're loading up on debt, you know, to chase that dream. And, and there is no shame in that, in that struggle. And knowing that the person across from you is very caring and concerned and very tactful, but also willing to help you kind of stretch your thinking a little bit. And I think that's kind of the key is to think about ways that we can maybe kind of put a little bit of this aside and let's just articulate kind of where there may be areas where in a scenario we could come up with, which isn't you, but in another scenario, similar or different situation that you might see an expansion or contraction of just changing one thing and just changing one thing here and then kind of coming back to it. Not making a decision today is almost one of my favorite lines, no matter what, (laughs) because I think, you know, we can kind of kick the tires a little bit and stress test something. And another thing that I often say to folks in my office is just how important it is to know that nothing that we make in terms of decisions today is irreversible. At least I haven't found one yet. (laughs) Um, So I think there's just a lot of compassion and vulnerability and just the kind of leaning into those conversations and and to your point Taylor about just sort of feeling out is this person kind of catching me a little bit when I'm falling and if you're not feeling that you know there's definitely a lot of folks out there um, you know and I'd be turned off by that too if I wasn't feeling like that reciprocation because this is really touchy stuff and you know none of us is like the um, master of it all we're just trying to really find what's best for you because if I don't have all the answers I'd want to help you find somebody else too who can who can push you through something in many ways it almost feels like a uh, I'm just thinking of playing you know youth sports growing up and finding that coach who's like willing to to find ways to bring the best out of you right I mean that's that seems like a big part of it and I think I think maybe Terrell mentioned earlier too just when know your brand first right? Because if you don't know that, you're, you're not going to really know if that person's really aligning with you up front. Um, and yeah, you, you don't have to stick with someone. I think that's, it's so easy to fall into the convenience of like, well, I know this person now, they're just my go-to for that. But sometimes you got to take a step back and do what's best for you. And it's not, there's no shame in testing the waters with somebody and telling them that up front. I mean, for realtors, I interview my realtors before I use them. And that's kind of crazy to some people. But for me, you're going to be in my home. You're going to help me find my next home. I need to be interviewing you. And there's no shame in that. And, yeah. And, 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 you know, ditto to that. I mean, you know, people come to us all the time because, you know, they're looking for a second legal opinion. I suspect that a lot of our clients go elsewhere for their second opinion or third opinion. So, yeah, you're definitely not, you know, locked in. And if something doesn't feel right, go with your gut and, and you know, move on or dabble somewhere else. And, and so you have something to compare it to. Yeah. I'll echo that sentiment. It's like you're, you interview for a job, right? 
So why wouldn't you interview your professionals? And so I always tell my students, I'm like, when you're out there and you're in the adulthood and you're finding your own advisor, trust your gut. If they don't jive with you, then it's time to move on. Most of these relationships, especially as a business owner, you're really trying to create long-term relationships. So it, in the industry as a business owner, the advice that I got, which was mind-blowing, it was like, what is it? Hire slow, fire flat, fast. And the same thing goes with your, your professional community. It's like, if they're not driving, get rid of them and move on to the next person and take that time to interview. And just like everybody said, don't feel pressured into it. If it feels good, go for it. But there's different styles, right? We all learn differently and we all jive differently. We just don't get along with everybody. So it's important that you get along with that professional, that you can feel, uh, to LW's point, vulnerable. Can you feel vulnerable with them? If not, and you always feel like you have to be guarded, listen to your gut. So, hi, this is uh, three parts to my questions, and it's around the, the different banking accounts or the separate accounts. So, Ben, you had said half dozen different bank accounts. Um, part one is could you name them, please, in a moment. And then, the, um, Terrell, the three account system, I'd like a little clarification on that. Um, and then what is the best bank or credit union to use for all of these separate accounts that will not We're charge us a fee? <laughs> so, uh, I'm, and I'm sorry, w what was the question about the six accounts? Did, what was? Yeah, I you mean, said you want that. a half dozen different bank accounts. And then you said something about um, emergency fund, taxes. Yeah, I, I think I was just pulling a random number, it depends on your circumstances. So some folks, some, you know, some businesses will have a designated payroll account, but if you have no staff, though, then you won't need that payroll account. So um, basically just whatever special purpose accounts you may need for your situation. I might get out a smidge more, well, no, I'm not the banker, um, but you know, I've had folks um, who have built up a life, um, you know, in terms of their, they're property owners, property managers, you know, they've got multiple properties. And so having an individual account for each of those, sometimes just that escrow and other things, it's designated, you know, the payments go into that, the rent payments go into that, or, or you know, outflows go into just that. And each one, if they own three houses, they would have each, you know, individual accounts, not all coming into the same account. And then the tax account could be one account. Um, to do all these things, though, you know, I've had to advise clients sometimes um, going through the process of knowing your, your legal structure and getting the EIN numbers from the IRS. Um, those certainly help and, and are needed um, for banking. And then also um, I've had a client recently who had trouble getting a, an account because of not having, you also I think have to have the address and it can't just be a PO box. So there's a lot of different steps kind of involved in that um, to have those documents and documentation. Um, luckily in our case, we had a, an existing relationship with that client. We could open up the business account, we could open up you know, the credit card account and whatnot. But if you don't have all those and you're starting from scratch, which it sounds like you could be, then certainly having those, um, you know, EIN numbers and, and certainly getting the mail coming and those sorts of things. Thank you. I think the moral of the story is that there is not going to be a set number of accounts. There's There could only be one your whole length in business and that could be totally fine. Uh, it's what works for you. I see a lot of tax accounts I think that's probably the most frequent one that I see. But I also see a lot of credit card, like fee accounts. I see that because you do have to put kind of money aside for fees if you don't pay for them up front. So a lot of considerations, and it just depends on what works for you. Um, as a banker, I see all of it. So there's no right answer. But if you'd like to talk about it more, certainly you can find a banker um, or I can help you. <laughs> Uh, so to answer your question on the three accounts, so we have our main account, that's our checking account, which on the personal side is where we pay all of our bills out of. And then on the business side, that's what we call our operating account. So same idea, all of our bills. Tied directly to that, we have what we call the small savings. So it's a direct, easy to transfer. And so what I teach clients is essentially we create what's called a floor. So let's just say my floor is $3,000. 
So set number of dollars come in, my paychecks come in, regular, say ideally the same amount every single month. I pay my bills and then I measure back to that 3,000. So if I'm below the 3,000, mentally, my account's not negative, but mentally I'm negative. So I'm using that small savings to replenish back to my floor, that 3,000, starting the next month all over again. So it just becomes a quick measuring stick. So you know exactly what came in, you know your positives and your negatives all throughout the year, so you create that pattern. So some business owners, when they're starting out, can somewhat use that model. Sometimes when cash flow is absorbent, then it becomes a little bit more difficult. Um, and then the third account is what we call our big savings. So again, on the personal side, we've done our budget, right? So we already know what we need to come into that checking account. Whatever is surplus, get it out of those accounts. Because if we see extra money in that checking account, we have human nature. We know what we're going to do. So what I teach clients to do is we direct deposit that. So this is where, again, with our business owners who are just starting out, they might actually still have a part-time job or even a full-time job where they're starting this new business. So we keep their regular income in their accounts and we create that separate business account where all the business revenue goes to. Now, some of my clients need that to live on. So now we create a set amount that gets paid out from that business account. So it's just easy. Again, we're keeping those dollars exactly the same every month that are coming into that billing or the operating account. So it's just easy measure. So how many, we have some different ages. How many of you guys remember the checkbook, the balancing your checkbook? They do still exist. I would just, well, I'm saying my, my younger ones, they don't. They're like, everything's online. I don't need to. I even have my paycheck on Cash App, which I'm like. <laughs> So it's like the, it's basically the modern age of the old fashioned balance your checkbook every single month so you know exactly what your personal cash flow looks like, but then you can do the same thing on your business so you know what your business cash flow looks like. Business is a little bit challenging because most of us, our revenue is constantly changing. So some clients will create a separate account where all the revenue goes into and then they do it that way where they can, again, measure the business cash flow. So to the point that Ben was making, it's really what I say for clients, the core is a three, but you can always add to that. So you can add that tax count. Um, I'll give you an example. I have uh, clients who, they have a vacation account, they have a pet count, they have a classic car account for any renovations. <laughs> they have the whole list and I love it, but I'm like, the core three is all I care about. The rest is great, but they've automated their entire expenses. So all of those accounts. So when they go to book a vacation, they look at the vacation account. When they have pet issues or want to get something for the pet, they look at the pet account. When they need to repair the car, they look at the car account. And so you can basically make it how you wish. Be mindful of fees. <laughs> so there's banks out there that don't charge the fees. I can't recommend a bank, but, <laughs> but that's the idea. Is that helpful to that answer? That question? Yeah. Terrell, that's not helpful. I think you just gave my <laughs> wife an idea. She's in the audience. I think she's going to put all of our money into the cat account. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> do we have yeah. any other questions? Yeah. I do. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm really grateful for the first question that um, was asked here and y'all starting to talk about the vetting process. Um, I come from, we're like an emerging cooperative, complicated <laughs> situation. Um, and so what I want to, oh yes, is very, very <laughs> exciting. And one of the challenges that we've had is finding a, a CPA, an account, a bookkeeper, a, um, attorney who's like really excited about learning and advising. And so um, I'll keep my question broad for most people and then also add in if you have any specific recommendations for co-ops um, I recommend them or I would welcome them and be grateful um, so what questions specifically would you all recommend that we ask when interviewing potential financial advisors CPAs the team when it, when uh, interviewing the team So I would take a step back and say, when you're looking for these professionals, don't forget your own value and don't forget your own network. Because most of us go through recommendations, right? You refer me to a CPA, I'm more likely to talk to that CPA, probably even work with that CPA, versus me just doing some research. So first of all, 
see who else is in your situation and see who they're using. And that can easily quickly align somebody who's in your same exact situation using a CPA or an advisor that understands that space, easy transition. Um, as to questions, I say I wouldn't have specific, but I would say the theme of the questions. What are you not willing to tolerate? What are your non-negotiables when working with any of those professionals? And ideally, what are you looking for? So asking what is their experience in that area? So get that vibe. Again, the idea is to start that conversation. Um, and the biggest piece I would say is see if they're a team player. I have to say all of us up here, we know we don't sit in all of the seats. We can't sit in all the seats. We have to be good at what we do. And to do that, we need partners. I'm not a lawyer. I don't have that background. I need good lawyers when it comes to working with my clients, especially the business owners, high net worth, we really need to make sure the legal team is in place. Same idea, we talk tax efficiency. I'm not a tax accountant, I cannot give tax advice. I need quality CPAs to work with, and ultimately they're not always my network, I have to be able to work with the client. So ultimately, if you're really looking to expand, make sure that the people that you're working with are cool to collaborate. I mean, I've had some clients who their professionals don't collaborate. And so I let the client know there's nothing I can do. I can't force them to collaborate with me, but I can't give you tax advice. So our hands are tied here. So you need to go take what I'm teaching you and go to the accountant, which you know that's the telephone game. So again, I, the big takeaway was make sure they would collaborate and again, use your own network. And it might not even be what do I ask them it may be, what do they ask me? Are they inquisitive? Are, or are they just listening to me tell my sob story about how I woke up one day and started this business because I was just laid off? I mean, knowing that they care about you and truly want to know who you are, and even the personal questions. As a banker, I love just asking, where are you from? You know, what do you do for fun? Because you kind of find the roots of a person that way. Uh, and that goes a really, really long way when it comes to that relationship. So it, maybe it's not what you ask them. It's how, you know, what they ask you. Yeah, and, and no doubt go with your gut, you know, to a large degree. But, um, you know, I'll say from, you know, from attorney perspective, uh, I know being one and talking with them a lot, I don't think, you know, generally speaking, attorneys have the types of personalities that are going to woo you over, uh, you know. Um, so just... <laughs> You know, and, and nor, and, and, you know, and, and to be, you know, and, 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 you know, and truth be told, you know, you're not looking for a friend either. You know, sometimes, you know, when we're sitting across the table from a client, you know, we need to look them in the eye and give them frank advice. And we're not there to make friends. Sometimes, you know, you, we, you need to be, you know, we need to give, you know, tell you how it is. Um, you say, hey, you're walking into a, you know, a legal landmine there. And so, um, so yeah, no, it's a combination of facts. You need, it needs to feel right. But, uh, but again, you know, you also want to have someone who you trust who can give it to you straight too. And don't sell yourself short, Ben. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh. I've got a question on um, creating an LLC. So I know you can do it like online yourself or you can hire an attorney. So what's the pros and cons, please? Yeah, well, so a pro, I mean, so that would usually be better than nothing at all, right? At least there's an attempt there um, to, to have some kind of protection. Um, you know, pros, cons, pros, you know, so again, something better than nothing, cheaper in cost. You know, the cons is that, you know, you know, are you really going to be fleshing out all the details? Because in this LLC operating agreement, you're going to be, you know, depending on the nature of your business, right, you want to address potential liability concerns. You're going to make certain tax elections that could, um, you know, that, that could impact not only you, but potential business partners. It could um, help or impede your growth. So you're making a lot of different um, elections within the LLC that could not only situate yourself, you know, for right now, but you're also trying to potentially tee yourself up for later on. Not that you necessarily need to know how your business is going to progress, but the point is you want to have your LLC operating agreement drafted in such a way um, that works for you now and works for you uh, so that you can amend it depending on what trajectory you're going. Um, but, you know, you know, frankly, we see it all the time, people downloading uh, stuff off the Internet. Look, I mean, you know, do it at your own peril. Sometimes it can be just fine. I mean, look, depending on your business, you know, 
if it's fairly simple, you don't have any employees, there's no risk. Yeah, maybe that's fine. Um, but if, you know, if you have employees and, you know, there is risk and you're looking at growth, get out in front of this now. And I, I would, I would, I would say get C counsel and get that right. Um, I, I would be very leery about downloading stuff online, um, at, across the board, but a lot of people, frankly, you know, when you're just starting out, you're understandably so worried about incurring legal costs, at least, you know, call up attorney, get a ballpark um, figure as to how much that might cost, what that endeavor might be. I wouldn't just write that off and just go to the internet and print something out. At least do some due diligence to, 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 to explore what getting it right would cost, what that endeavor would be. Internet. Um, would you say it's better to have an INC, an INC, or, or an LLC? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 really kind of um, I hate it when pe people always hate these answers when they're asking us, you know, asking these questions. But it's just, you know, it, it really does depend. It's so fact intensive. It really does depend on where you're doing business. Are you doing it on the internet? Are you doing it um, in an office location? Are you doing it in several office locations? Are you doing it beyond the state lines? Are you doing it beyond international borders? So I mean, all these things are, are 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 things that we'll take into consideration um, in in deciding you know what route to go. And then within that, I'll also add, you know, if you're going to the Inc. route, a corporation route, there's, there's decisions within there. There are various flavors of corporations as well. So it's really fact intensive. That's why we'll, you know, we'll sit down. It takes a good at least hour to start, you know, kind of navigating this stuff. I think on the premise of both of those last two questions, you certainly can do it online. And that might be your only option at first. But always do checkups. I mean, we go to the dentist, we go to the doctor's. Do checkups, you know, see your counsel, see your CPA, like cue in that team of yours and make sure that you cue them in frequently and not when things are too late. Right. And if you don't have one of those yet, attend a networking event like we're doing tonight and make those connections, right? <laughs> Any other questions? Well, this was great, quite engaging. And I love that you, all the panelists were vulnerable as well, right? So we can relate to you. Um, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, and now we could end it and go upstairs and network. <laughs> Bye. Let's give it up for the panelists. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.